Genesis 9. Turn there. Let's start. And I, I would say, out of the many things that God has shown me from this book, uh, the teaching about clouds and Christ's return and hope, um, Genesis 9 and the teaching surrounding the rainbow, probably one of my favorite it's near the top of the list of favorite things that I just love to show God's Word, what it says. Absolutely amazing. God did not leave anything out of the Bible that we need to know. Everything's there. Whether we see it today, how it really is, or not, it's there. I believe, 100%, I believe, that even the day and the hour of our Lord's return is written in this book because God does nothing but what he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. And I believe it. I even believe, you know, when John saw the mighty angel come down from heaven and he heard the seven thunders utter their voices, and John said, I was about to write, and a voice from heaven said, don't write what the seven voices, what the seven thunders said. I believe they're in here. I believe whatever the seven thunders said are in this book. But John didn't write it. He didn't write it in John. He didn't write it in 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Revelation. John did not write down what he heard the seven thunders say, but they're written in this book. 100% guaranteed. Do I know it? No. I have a theory, I have a guess, but I don't know it. One of these days, however, see, that's a prophetic event. That's going to happen in the future, and I believe we're going to hear it, okay? So everything that we need to prepare for the coming of our Lord and the days that we're going into, they're written in this book, 100% guaranteed they are in this book. And those who believe it, God will open their eyes to it. He doesn't keep secrets. He tells us the mysteries. They're revealed to us. So Genesis 9, <clears throat> I have verse 8 up on the screen, but I want to go back a little bit. In verse 7, God says this again. In verse 7, and you be ye fruitful and multiply. And remember that phrase, be fruitful, nine times in the King James Bible. This is Genesis 9. So 9 is the number for fruit bearing fruit, bringing forth fruit, and you think of trees, you think of a harvest, and you think of the birth of a baby, birth of a child. And all through the Bible, when a child is born, especially a man-child, that is a picture of Christ. It's a picture of hope. It's a picture of salvation. When Ruth brought her child forth, she gave that baby to Naomi and said, Naomi, here's your hope now. Here's your fulfillment. Guess what? You are now hereby redeemed. And this is your son. And you're going to raise him as your son. And he's going to inherit everything that your husband lost when he died. And your two sons. You're going to get that back through this child. And it was a symbol of hope. It was a symbol of God honoring his word and God honoring his promise. The Shunammite woman who had never had a baby. She was an older woman, we believe. And that's all she wanted. And the prophet Elisha prophesied, you're going to have a baby. She said, don't tell me that. Don't say that to me. She'd lived all of her life wanting that, but got to an age where she said, I guess that's never going to happen. And I've been to that place before where I thought, God's not going to do this, okay? But he did. And the birth of that child was that woman's hope restored. Even after it died, he had to be brought back to life again. Now she's really, now she really sees the power of God, okay? So that's what that number represents. Be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And uh, I watched a documentary over the weekend about 
the search on Mer Mount Ararat, there's been several expeditions up there. They have heard stories in time past of people who have gone to Mount Ararat and seen the ark. Uh, some of the stories differ in how they're written, but many of them say that it's been broken half. And when, when times when it's really, there's a lot of drought and it's really warm up on the mountaintop and the ice recedes, they said, you can see it. But it's been years since that happened. But they went up to, the, they went up to Mount Ararat and they took ground radar, ground penetrating radar, to, to examine the glaciers that are on top of Mount Ararat. And you know what they found? Nothing. They didn't find, they spent all this money. They had a permit. The time of the permit expired. They had to get down off the mountain because bad weather's coming in. And they didn't find it. Do we still believe that the ark rested on Mount Ararat? Do we still believe that the, God covered the world with water? Do we still believe that? Yes. Okay. So why has nobody found the ark? Why hasn't it been found, photographed, measured, filmed, videoed? Why hasn't God allowed that to happen? I don't know. But I don't need that to believe what this book says. It'd be great. I've, want, I've hoped for that all my life. But I'll still believe the book. Amen? So verse 8. God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. So anytime he says the word covenant, it's a picture of the New Testament. And in this is a picture of the New Testament. And he said, And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant. If God gives a covenant, there's always a sign of it. The Abraham covenant, the sign was circumcision. The Mosaic covenant was represented by the Ten Commandments. The written law of God, written with God's own finger. That was a symbol and a token of God's covenant with them. The new covenant is represented here, this due in remembrance of me, and the bread and the wine of uh, the Last Supper, and it, the bread and the wine are the covenant representing God's covenant with man through Jesus Christ. And that covenant is an everlasting covenant. And if God makes a promise, and there's two, two things about promises that God makes. Some of the promises, oh, there she is. Hi, darling. You just let me know you're here, aren't you? I love you. In some covenants, in some promises God makes, there's an if in there. There's a condition that man must meet. Like the, the Moses covenant, the Ten Commandments, God said, I'll bless you. I'll take good care of you. I'll make you wealthy. I'll prosper you. I'll get rid of all your enemies. If you'll do these commandments. Well, they didn't do those commandments. And God had long suffering with them. But finally God cut it off and said, I'm, I, I, can't, I can't work with you. I'm done. Wrote Israel bill of divorce and said, you're out. Okay? So some covenants in the Bible have conditions with them. This covenant here doesn't. There's no condition whatsoever where God will break the covenant, change his mind, and say, okay, I said it. But you went and did this again, I'm going to flood the earth again. He never says that. So every time, and I love this, we still see rainbows, do we not? Still see them. Thunderstorms come, sun hits it just right, you're going to see a rainbow. I love seeing double rainbows. Fascinating to me, okay? That's a sign of the first and second coming. But anyway, we still see rainbows, it's still a sign of God's promise, and he's never ever broken that promise, ever. So it leads many scientists around the world to believe that there was no such flood because it's, it's never happened in recorded history. So they believe that it didn't happen. And yet, every tribe, every culture, every group of people has a Noah's Ark flood story. Every one of them. They're different. But they all say almost the exact same thing. God or the gods 
was angry and upset about something, it was going to flood the earth, cover the land, but he saved a small group of people on a boat. That's their story. And it's everywhere, all over the world. So that tells me this Bible is right. But God said, I'm not going to do that ever again. And so he said, verse 12, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And think about what it represents. We see the, the arch of the rainbow. It touches the clouds. It's up in the heavens. And yet it comes down and touches the earth which leads the Irish people to believe that there's a pot of gold and a leprechaun sitting there. Whatever. But what it, to me, what that conveys is God is bridging heaven and earth together through that rainbow. That's the sign of it. So God's kept his promise. And so he says in verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass. Now read this, read this carefully and underline this passage. When I bring a cloud over the earth. When I do. Not if. When. And my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, a cloud is coming. The darkest cloud ever. It's coming. And he said... When I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Verse 15, and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant, which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. I want to have a word of prayer. And when I get into this, I want somebody to go through this passage we just read. And tell me the number of times he mentions the cloud, and the number of times he mentions the token and the covenant. Okay? I don't have, I don't know it. I've just, but I'm interested in the numbers here. Okay? Because he keeps mentioning it over and over and over again. Why? I think it has significance. But let's, let's pray, then you count and I'll teach. Father, I love your word. I love this Bible. I thank you, God, for what it's brought to my life. This gift is so precious to me. And I, just, I love it. I love your word. And I thank you, God, for making promises to us that you are going to keep. And hell itself can't quench it, can't stop it. And thank you for the sign of that covenant, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We thank you, God, for keeping your promise to us always. We are sorry, God, that we don't keep our promises to you. But we trust you. And you have been always faithful to us. And you've been faithful to all mankind. In promising man, you would never, ever flood the earth with water again. And we believe that. So Father, we look forward to the day when we see the bow in the cloud again. Make us ready for that day, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said... Amen. Now, if you were counting while I was praying, I'm not going to call on you. Turn to, turn to Joel, chapter 2. <clears throat> Remember, Solomon said, The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. And there is no new thing under the sun. So I've learned that all the way back in Genesis, that what has happened will happen. Jesus himself Drew our attention to it when he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of the Man. And how many, how many teachings can be pulled from that? How many things can we see in that statement? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And you have the symbolism of the ark. You have the symbolism of the water. You have the symbolism of, of the number of animals and the types of animals, clean and unclean. And why there went to in, the unclean went in by twos and the clean went in by seven. Why did God do that? So many pictures that you can draw from. And here's yet another one. The promise that God made that there is a day of clouds coming. And it's coming not just to one part or one people, not just to one nation. It's coming to the entire world. 
Everybody around the world is going to be affected by this. And it has everything to do with the promise of Jesus appearing one day in the clouds. And I am going to meet him there. Amen. Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow ye the what? Trumpet. What are we waiting? What did Paul say we were going to hear? The trumpet's going to sound. Blow you the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord. That, underline that phrase, day of the Lord. Search that out through the scriptures. Day of the Lord. Peter said, or Paul said, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And he said, the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. And then he says, it's a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Now, what, what did Egypt go through? What happened in Egypt when Pharaoh decided to not let God's people go? God sent a darkness to Egypt. And what was it that was so remarkable about that darkness? The Bible said it was a darkness that they, it could be felt. You could actually feel the darkness. That's not a normal nighttime event. This is a supernatural event. Took place with Moses. And yet, to me, this I would love to see. That we could do this with computers now. We could make this graphic, CGI. A man walking out of Egypt in the darkness and walking into Goshen, all of a sudden it's light. And he looks over back in Egypt and he just sees a wall of black in front of him. And yet, in the land of Goshen, the sun's shining, kids are playing, everybody's eating, they're enjoying themselves. But in Egypt, everybody is in darkness that is so dark, they feel the darkness on their skin. They can feel, it's almost like they could grab it in their hands. You could feel it on the surface of their face. The darkness was that thick. That is a supernatural darkness. And I believe that's what's coming. A day of clouds and of thick darkness. Thick describes something that has matter. By the way, let me stop right here. They thought for years that light was just waves, like radio waves. They thought that's what light was. Then they found out that yes, light is a wave, but they also found out that light is matter, mass, particles, called photons. So it's a, it's a weird thing in the universe that light is both waves and particles at the same time i can't explain it i'm not that way i'm just mass particles pieces put together but light's different it's both waves and particles at the same time weird stuff so whatever this darkness was had mass to it because they could feel it and then he said as the morning spread upon the mountains and then he tells us what this darkness is it's a great people and a strong this is no ordinary people. This is not the Russians. It's not the Chinese. It's not the North Koreans. It's not the Democrats. This is a mighty, great people from a higher realm than us. These are evil spirits. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Nothing will. We were watching videos, different videos of that explosion in Lebanon. And it amazed me that you had apartment buildings facing that explosion and the shock wave blew through those apartment buildings, blew out the windows in the back of that building. 
You could see it plain. I've never seen anything like that in my life. That just blows me away. Nothing escaped that blast. Nothing did. And when this darkness comes on the earth, there will be no escape from it except in Jesus Christ. Okay? Then here's a double witness. Turn to Zephaniah 1. Out of the mouth of two witnesses or three shall every word be established. The book of Zephaniah, beautiful, beautiful book. You ought to read it. When you get to heaven, you'll be able to say to Zephaniah, I read your book. Thought it was great. I would have said it a little different, but it's okay. It's your book. You'll be able to meet this man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. The great, here he says it again, day of the Lord is near. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near, says it twice. And hasteth greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. In other words, people that think they're tough, people that, oh, I've got weapons, I got my AR, I, I'm ready to go. They're going to fall down to the ground and cry like little babies. Again, this is not the Russians coming. It's not the Chinese. These are evil spirits. And he said, that day, verse 15, is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. Underline that phrase, a day of trouble. That's mentioned several times in your Bible. Day of trouble and, and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. And then a day of clouds and thick darkness. Here he says it twice. Zephaniah 1 Joel chapter 2, clouds and thick darkness, both of them. So two witnesses to this event that is going to take place. It is a darkness again. That when you use the word thick, you're describing matter. Paint is thick or if it was that MAB paint we use, that junk paint, that stuff was thin. I hated it. I told Ron not to buy that junk no more, right? Remember that? Go with Glidden's. That's a good thick paint. This darkness is thick, has matter to it. You'll be able to feel it. Then he says, verse 16, the day of trumpet and alarm. That's what Joel said. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm. Same event. And the trumpet's going to sound. So if you were to take this idea, the day of the Lord, and it's a day of trumpets, and go to the book of Revelation, where are you going to put this event at? Who's got a guess? Where are you going to put it? There's three primary events take place in the book of Revelation. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials of wrath. So where do you think this event falls in relation to, to those three things? Huh? Day of trumpets. The sounding of the seven trumpets, I believe, is linked with this. It's a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, God says, that they shall walk like blind men. Because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Now, just... Think about that for a minute. What has to happen in order for flesh to be turned into dung? Huh? Something has to eat you. Remember Jezebel? It was prophesied that she would be dung in the field. And the dogs ate her body up and Five hours later, what did they do to her? God's word, exactly the way he said it. These things are, these things are going to happen. They matter. Blood poured out. Flesh is the dung. Verse 18. Ne listen to this. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them the day of the Lord's wrath. So what are people doing? Phil, what are people doing as far as silver and gold? What's everybody doing? They're hoarding it. Take your money and go buy silver. Why? Because we think cash is going to be worthless one day, right? We think the banks are going to fail. It happened in Germany, which 
It happened in Germany before World War II, which gave rise to Adolf Hitler. He used that to get the people on his side, and he basically just went into every country he could wage war against and stole everything they had, gave it to the German people. So in this event, all the people who've got all the gold and silver, and I'm not speaking out against gold and silver, I'm not saying anything against it. People have sent us, this church, gold and silver, and we have it in a safe. Okay, we haven't cashed it in. I talked to the guys about it. They said, hang on to it. So we hang on to it. Not going to tell you how much. Okay, not going to tell you where. But it's in a safe. Okay. So, something happens. And we need it. We'll have it. So, but anyway, in this event, you're not going to buy your salvation. You're not going to buy your safety. It's not going to happen. So, uh, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. So two witnesses telling us a day of clouds is coming, and it's a day of clouds and thick darkness, and that is exactly, you, Egypt is your model here for what happened. Now, Ezekiel 30, turn there. We have further witnesses that there is coming a day. I believe it's associated with the seven trumpets. I don't make any claim as to how long that happens. I don't believe it takes seven years. I don't believe that. Ezekiel 30 verse 2. So the man prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, how ye woe worth the day. Woe is in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 9 specifically. He said two woes are past. One of those woes was the opening of the bottomless pit. Okay? So he said, um, woe worth the day. For the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. A cloudy day. And it shall be the time of the heathen. And then you look in Ezekiel 38 verse 1. This is a prophecy about Gog. And who is Gog? He is a chief prince. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. He is a spirit. I believe Gog is a principality spirit, like the prince of Persia, the prince of Israel, which is Michael. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Ephesians 2, we have the Prince of the Power of the Air. So on and so forth. We have principality spirits, that, and they do rule over people. Um, I showed the guys that came to my office earlier today a video of what's going on right now. And it was people, guys rioting, burning stuff down, throwing rocks and fireworks and everything like that. And I asked them, I said, where is that? And everybody said, Portland. That looks like Portland. And I said, nope. Uh, is that Seattle? Nope. Chicago? Nope. Is that happening in St. Louis? Nope. Beirut. Ron, they're rioting in Beirut against their government because they knew their government was so corrupt to allow all that stuff to be stored in that warehouse for six years, waiting for a disaster. How do we know that they didn't have Iranian arms in that building? Because you could see the fire at some point. I watched a new video today. It's a close-up view. And you could see the fire get real intense. And all of a sudden, stuff started shooting out everywhere. What was in that warehouse? What else was in that warehouse? And people are rioting right now. And I, what I believe is there is a spirit covering this earth. Causing people to riot everywhere. What would happen then... If rioting took place in every city, not just in America, around the world. One thing I know is that the people, good and bad, are sick and tired of corrupt government. Sick of it. And they'll, they'll riot. I'm not, I'm not a fighter. Not a mean guy. 
not looking for trouble. But I saw a guy tweet yesterday, and he said, if anything happens to my president, I personally will lead the war. Do you think if anything happened to Trump and Pence, do we want Nancy Pelosi to be our president? Because she's next in line. She is next in line. And there are 100 million people in this country who will not let Nancy Pelosi be president. Don't come at me. I'm just telling you what I think. I'm an analyst, not an insider. Okay, not trying to incite. I'm just telling you what I think could happen. Okay? There is a spirit, a principality over this earth right now. People are rioting. So anyway... Uh, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back, put hooks into thy jaws, and will bring thee forth, and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Now ask yourself the question, what country in this world still fights with swords? No, they, they shoot bullets and grenade launchers. and Yeah, but they don't really fight with them. If, if Japan was to go to war against another nation, would they use their swords? Not anymore. That's my point. The sword now is symbolic. In every, in every army around the world, the sword is still there. It's symbolic, but it's not used. We don't put bayonets on the ends of guns anymore. We just give them more bullets. Okay? That's my point. This is a prophecy of what's going to happen in the future. And there is not an army in this world that fights with bucklers and shields and swords. And rides horses. They don't ride horses. So what is this army? Spirits. Because they still hold swords. And they ride horses. Okay? They have a lot of horsepower. Okay? Verse 9, here's what it says. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. So this matches what we saw in Joel he said, the clouds are a great people that's coming. So then Ezekiel says that when Gog and his army ascends, that means they come up, they're going to cover the land as a cloud. Okay? And many people with thee. So is, the, is there a cloud coming? A dark, evil cloud? Yes. And it's real. It's a cloud of spirits. And this next war is going to be a spiritual war. Amen? But if my wife is in a medical building and there's a crazy guy in there shouting, I'm going to pray as I drive over there, which I did. And I was ready to defend my wife's life. Even with my own. I'm not going to let my wife get killed. Okay? Ezekiel 38, 16. This is still talking about Gog, the chief prince. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover a land. And he says it twice. And it shall be in the latter days. And I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. And if you keep reading Ezekiel 38, this is what's interesting. Gog gets defeated. And let's see if we can find that verse. There's a prophecy in here about when they start burning their weapons. Have you ever read that? Um, look at Ezekiel 39, verse 8. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I've spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers and the bows and the arrows, the handstaves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. 
You don't burn swords. You don't burn shields. Something different about these weapons that it takes them seven years to burn them all. And it says in verse 10, said that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down uh, any out of the forest, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoil them, and rob those that rob them, saith the Lord God. And you have a picture of that in the days of Jehoshaphat, when the three armies came down, and they all fought one another, killed one another, and the Bible said the people of Israel just went out and took everything they had, took all their weapons, took all their gold, silver that they had on them, and spoiled them, went into their tents, took all their stuff, I mean, just came out with everything. That's what's going to happen on that day. And it just makes me think that this army is unique and different, and their weapons are burnable somehow, some way. But I believe this is going to happen exactly the way the Bible says it. Jeremiah chapter 4, look at there, turn there. Oh, now here's where I get crazy. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 13. Underline this. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us. There's a woe here. There's a marker. When the Bible uses the word woe, it's connected with those woes in Revelation. Come on in. That's all right. You get the last few minutes of it. But look at that verse again. He shall come up as clouds, enemies, spirits, and his chariot shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are spoiled. Now, when he said they're swifter than eagles, that makes me connect that with Deuteronomy 28. Look at Deuteronomy 28 in verse... 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. These, again, these are not the Russians. These are not the Germans. It's not the Babylonians. A nation of fierce countenance. In Daniel, you have the king of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favor to the young. So, here you have an army that God is going to allow to come in. And it's an army of spirits. Very evil, mean devils. Can't understand their language. Fierce, evil countenance, their face. They fly, their horses fly faster than eagles. Woe unto us. Okay? Um, again, New York Times come out with an article last week saying the Pentagon now acknowledges that they have vehicles that were not made on this earth. Pentagon said it. Okay? Is that possible? Yes. According to the Bible? Yes. Absolutely. These are the chariots. Exodus 19. We're going to change keys a little bit. So, there's coming a day when God is going to bring a cloud over the land. Now, why do you think he went and... Did anybody do the counting there in Genesis 9? What did you come up with, Sandy? Four clouds, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and seven covenants. And what does seven mean? Holiness, perfection, sanctification, completion. Okay? I knew it, was in, I knew it had to be a, had to follow a pattern. There's a reason for everything that God does. God speaks in order. and gives us understanding by that order. So it's related to salvation the four times he mentions the bow, that's our Savior in four Gospels. 
So, we know there's a cloud coming. We know there's a day of clouds. The day of the Lord is coming. And God literally, and I believe this, literally God is going to blanket the entire earth with devils. Bringing a darkness that is thick. You'll be able to go, ooh, that's thick. You'll be able to touch it. And know its presence. And God says, now when I do this, I want you to remember something. I don't break my promise. Don't go building an ark. I've already got one ready. So in Exodus 19, God's going to meet with his people. Okay? And again, I've mentioned Brother Jason Cooley. He brought this to my attention this week. I like it when other people find things that I don't see in the Bible. Tell me about it. I like that. I'm not jealous of them. Okay? I used to be. I'd say, God, why didn't you give me that? And God said, I just did. Weren't you listening? <laughs> just because I gave it to him. Didn't it? You know, it's not a contest. Oh, okay. But he said, God meets Israel in a mountain and speaks to them in a mountain. But then he shows Moses the tabernacle. Moses builds the tabernacle. Now God speaks out of the tabernacle to the people of Israel. And I went, that's us. We're the tabernacle of God. God is speaking out of every, and ought to be, out of every one of us. Somebody ought to be talking about God to people. Amen? What's wrong with that? Not a thing. I don't have a problem in the world going up to a guy who's got a military cap on, talking to him. Tell me, tell me where you served. Tell me, tell me what army were you in? Did, did you, were you in Korea? Were you in Vietnam? And they tell me their story. Or if I'm wearing my Trump hat and I see another guy, we talk. Okay? Let's talk about Jesus now. Let's talk to people. Don't, you don't have to be ridiculous about it. You don't have to be offensive about it. Don't be rude about it. But let God's word come out of your mouth to someone at some point. Amen? So in Exodus 19... Verse 16, it came to pass on the third day. This is a third day time prophecy. So you have from the time of Christ's first coming, day one, thousand years, day two, thousand years. So it's been 2,000 years, roughly, since Christ's birth and death were somewhere in there. And so the Bible's telling us that on the third day, and it, when it says early in the morning, that lets you know that it's at the beginning of the thousand years, not at the end of the thousand years. It's in the morning. And so when it came to pass on the third day in the morning, it's at the beginning, that there were thunders and lightnings, and what? A thick cloud upon the mountain. And the voice of the trumpet. Here it is. So where is this, where is this event in the book of Revelation, it's somewhere in the seven trumpets. And the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people who was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Here they are going to meet God. God's coming down. The people are going up. Amen. Look at Isaiah 44, 22, just very quickly. I blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. What do you think God was doing when he came down? He's, gonna re he's redeeming them. He's blotting out their sins with a thick cloud so that their sins cannot be seen ever again. God covered your sins so that they're never ever as far as God is concerned God's not going to bring them up ever again I like that I like that return unto me for I've redeemed thee Daniel 7 verse 13 I saw in the night visions behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him so here we have a prophecy of the son of man coming in the clouds. And Jesus himself quoted this. He referenced it. We're not going to get to it tonight. But he did. He's told the people on, uh, in Matthew 24. 
Behold, you shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. First of all, you're going to see him at the right hand of the Father. And then he's going to be coming in the clouds. And he's quoting Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He's referencing that. And I think anybody who's hearing Jesus teach that, who knew what Daniel said, they're putting it together and they're going, oh, he's going to fulfill prophecy. He's going to do it exactly the way Daniel said it was going to happen. Psalm 18, 11, he made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Where does God live? God lives in a place that is covered with thick clouds and dark waters. Why? Because we are not allowed to see him. God always, if you study, study this, go home tonight, get your Bible out, get your software out, and look at clouds like I did, and look at all the times in the books of Moses, like Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, where God came down and was in the tabernacle, but he was covered with a cloud. Before Aaron could go in on the Day of Atonement, before Aaron could go in to the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, with the blood, he had to light the incense in the most holy place so that room filled with smoke and God specifically said so that the smoke of the incense covers my glory so it doesn't kill Aaron when he goes into the most holy place that's God taking care of business God taking care of his high priest Aaron the high priest can't he's a sinner he cannot stand in the full presence of God. It will kill him. So what they do to the high priest on the Day of Atonement? What they do to his garment? They tied bells on it. And a rope. Because if the high priest went in and he didn't do stuff right, he had sin, God killed him. And whoever had to drag him out was not even allowed to go into the most holy place that when they heard the bells stop ringing, start pulling the rope. That's God's holiness. We're not allowed to see it. It'll kill us. Moses got to see his back and he came down, his face shone so bright. They said, Moses, cover that up. So God hides. How far, Phil, how big is the universe? Hubble telescope sees galaxies that they say are about 12 billion year, light years away. And they think that that's probably not the end of the universe. It takes all of that blackness of space to hide God's glory from us so it doesn't kill us. That's what he says. Uh, very quickly, scientists tell us that about 80% of space is not empty. It's full of a substance that they call dark matter. Because they can't see it, they can't detect it, they can't hear it. No sensor that we have can pick it up, but we know that it's there because of the motions of the stars. It's actually moving stuff in the universe. They call that dark energy. They call it dark matter and dark energy because they can't see it, can't detect it, but they know it was there. So what if, what if an angel came in here and started turning the pages of my Bible and then walked away? We didn't see the angel, but we saw what it did, right? Okay? That's the idea. So I think that's in the Bible. See verse 11 of Psalm 18? His pavilion round about him were dark waters. And th I think the dark waters is the dark matter that they say fills the void of space. It's not empty. It's full of dark waters. And those dark waters prevent God's glory from killing every one of us. Psalm 57, 10. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds now stop and think about this what did lucifer say god's truth ascends up to the clouds right what did lucifer say he was going to do i will ascend above the heights of the clouds 
What does that mean? I'm going to be more than the Bible is. And isn't that his idea? Does he not succeed in doing that? Putting himself higher than God's word, which truth reaches under the clouds. Psalm 97, 2, clouds and darkness around about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. So I believe that universe, black, dark, that's that dark waters that hides God's glory way on the other side of the universe from us here on this little earth. But one of these days, we're going to get to see God's face. The Bible says so. I love that. Amen. One of these days, the clouds are going to part. And we're going to see him as he is. Amen. And we'll talk about Christ coming in the clouds next Sunday night. I love this. I like looking at clouds. Aren't they pretty? Beautiful. Beautiful. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what this book says. And thank you for the beautiful gifts that you've given us through this book. Thank you, Lord, for lighting our way, guiding us in our life, filling us with knowledge that the world, the world can't even handle it. The world won't accept it. The world won't believe it. They think that their wisdom is above your word. But Father, these people, they just believe what you said. And you show them great and mighty things through it. And I love you for that. I love it when God's people see things. Father, thank you for showing us. Open our eyes more. The day of clouds is coming, Father, and we ask you, God, to prepare us for that day. And Lord, when we see the clouds, help us to look for the bow so we'll be assured your covenant stands firm. Bless these people tonight. Help them, Lord, in their journey of life. We love them. We ask you to love them and bless them in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen.